Good morning. Welcome to Monticello United Methodist Church. Excited to have you here to worship with us this morning, here and there and everywhere. So as we begin the service, we call the classic. Uh, I want to ask you a question. It's going to seem like a silly question as it comes out of my mouth, which is not unusual, but um, think of a time when you've been nice to someone, which again is silly because we're Christians, we're at church, we're always nice to people, right? Think of a time you've been nice to someone when you uh, uh, had to go out of your way to be nice, when you really didn't want to. Um... Now, as we think of that and confess, it is a lot easier to be nice to someone when they've been nice to you or to me. What about being nice to someone if they haven't or if they've not been nice? That's what the pastors are going to preach to us about, so we'll, we'll see what we learn. Good to have you here. Morning. morning. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, today we, we give you thanks. Thanks for all the blessings. Thanks for all the, the ways that you carried us through this week, God. And today we come to worship you. So we ask your Holy Spirit would come today among us that we would breathe you in, and that today you would change our hearts. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join me in our call to worship. We have gathered as children of God promise or God's promise to keep alive our vision of hope. We have gathered on the mountaintop that we may be strengthened to live as God's children in the valleys of everyday life. We are on a pilgrimage of love and hope. We follow the footsteps of Jesus Christ, who was faithful because of God's promise. Let us pause on our journeys. Let us build a roadside altar, not of stones, but of praise to the God who guides us. Amen. Please stand as we sing our opening hymn.
Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to Mosley United Methodist Church. Welcome to those who are watching online um, and all of our different online campus options, those who are listening on the radio, those watching our delayed broadcasts. Welcome today to church. At this time, we invite you to turn, if you're here, say hello. Don't move, though. Uh, Text somebody, call somebody if you're online. Make sure they know that you're at church and you want them with them. And we invite the kids to come down for the message for all ages. Good morning, boys and girls. It's nice to see your faces today, your eyes. They're beautiful. I want to tell you about a story with cookies and Jesus. What? Cookies and Jesus. I know. So there was this woman, and her name was Miss Lottie Moon. And Miss Lottie Moon, she had six brothers and sisters, And she grew up in a house where they loved Jesus. Well, one of her sisters went to China to be a missionary. Does anybody know what a missionary is? A missionary is somebody who goes and tells people about Jesus. It's a pretty cool job. So Lottie's sister wrote her letters about how wonderful China was and how wonderful it was to teach people about Jesus. So guess what Lottie decided? She was going to do it too. So she packed up her things and she moved to China to be a missionary. Now Lottie had a classroom of children, like you guys, of children in China. And it was her job to teach them about Jesus. Well, the children thought, "Mm, I don't trust this girl. She looks different than us. She has a funny accent. So they didn't talk to her and they were scared of her. So Lottie thought, you know what? What does everybody love? Cookies. So Lottie made some cookies, and she was like, if I give these children cookies, they'll like me, and maybe they'll open up to me, they'll trust me, and I can teach them about Jesus. So I don't have cookies because Miss Sarah, she don't bake. But I have gummies, so I'm going to give you gummies, and I'm going to talk to you about Jesus. Because this was Miss Lottie Moon's way, and so this is Miss Sarah's way, except for not with the cookies. So... She baked these cookies, and she brought them into her classroom for her children to have. But the kids were like, okay, first this girl looks different than us. Second, this girl has a funny accent. And now she's making us cookies because she's obviously trying to poison us. So they did not eat the cookies because it was obviously poison, right? And so Lottie was like, okay. All I want is to teach these children about Jesus. Maybe if I just keep bringing cookies. I assume that she probably kept making them. She wouldn't bring the same cookies over and over. So she brought cookies every day. And she said, okay, one day these kids are going to trust me. They're going to eat a cookie, and then maybe I can tell them about Jesus. Well, one day a little boy was so hungry. He hadn't eaten anything, and he was really hungry, and so he was like, you know what, there's this plate of cookies, it's right in front of me, so he tried a cookie. And guess what happened? Nothing! Nothing happened, it was a delicious cookie, and he loved it. So all the other kids were like, okay, he didn't start throwing up, he didn't die, He's, this is obviously not poison cookies. So they ate cookies, and when they started eating cookies, they were happy, they were excited, and they began to trust Miss Lottie Moon, and so... Because they trusted her, what was she able to do now? Exactly, Aiden. She was able to tell them about Jesus because now they trusted her and they listened. And that is a way that cookies and Jesus, boom, combine. So back when Jesus was on this earth, when he was walking this earth, he talked and helped a lot of people. He helped a lot of people that didn't look like him, right? And that was what he did on earth. And as Christians, as people who are Christ followers, who follow Jesus, it's our job to be like Jesus. Now, 
Everybody is called to be a missionary, but do we need to go to China to be a missionary? No. A missionary is somebody who tells people about Jesus, and that is our job, friends. And we can do that in our classrooms. We can do that in our neighborhoods. We can, you know what? You don't even have to do it to people that just look like you, right? That means you don't even have to do it to just kids. You can tell grown-ups about Jesus. Did you know that? I, I challenge you, and I encourage you to tell not only kids about Jesus, to tell grown-ups too, because everybody needs to hear about Jesus, right? Right. All right. Let's pray, and then you can take those snacks to Adventures in Faith and eat them there, okay? Hold your hands. My turn, your turn. Dear God, thank you for today. Help us be like you and spread your love everywhere. We love you. Amen. All right, friends, you may go to Adventures in Faith. Will you join me in our affirmation of faith? We believe in God, who is love, whose love is manifest in all creation, in our lives, and in all people. We follow Christ, who embodied God's love in his life and ministry, his death and resurrection, and his granting to us the Spirit. He filled us with that love as well. We live by the Spirit, the presence of God's love in us. In that love, we participate in the church, the body of Christ, by loving God. We love through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service. Love is our faith and is a gift from God. 
We thank God and ask God's blessings that we may love in the name of Christ and the power of the Spirit. To God's glory. Amen. Today we have an excerpt from the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to read two of them. Uh, Pastor Kelly will read hers when she gets here. Um, but first we have Matthew 5, verses 21 through 24. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there, remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we're in uh, part two of our This is Living sermon series. Uh, last week we talked about this idea of worship is a lifestyle, that it's not something that we come, it's something that we become, and that worship is something that we are fully encompassed in, right? That worship is something that we should always be about, not a place that we're going. And through this This Is Living sermon series, we're talking about these, these fundamental things of Christianity, that if I place someone who is a Christian and someone who is not a Christian before you, they might not look different physically, but in their actions, in their words, in their deeds, you'll be able to tell One's a Christian and one is not. And today we're talking about one of the most fundamental aspects of all of Christianity. If we don't get this right, nothing else really matters. And that is the idea that loved people love people. Loved people love people. Now you may have heard the opposite of that. Hurt people hurt people. People that are the, the most hurt in the world tend to hurt other people, and that's true. But those who are most loved in the world should also love people more. That's an, also a true statement. Now, with this concept, we understand the idea that loved people is us. You know, the thing that draws people to God, the thing that brings us into the love of Christ is the love of Christ, right? The grace, the mercy, the idea that God came and was incarnated as Christ. And he, he walked among us and he lived a life without sin, and died for us, and was resurrected so that we can come and be in full relationship with God. That type of love we don't have any context for in our lives. It's a love that is so foreign, that is so outside of human understanding, that it draws us to God. That's what drew me to God as a teenager, this idea that even with all the messed up stuff in the world, and in my past, even with the times I know I failed everyone around me, that there's someone that loves me that much. That is the love that brought me to who Christ is and changed my life to where I would call myself a Christian. I'm a loved person. And friends, in case you didn't know, you are loved people. People loved by God. Jealously loved by God. And we like that part. We like the idea of God's love. We like the idea that you and I are, are somehow favored by the God on high. However, there's a flip side of that coin. Something that Jesus talks about more than almost anything else in his entire recorded words that we have. That we as people who are loved have to love other people. And the sad truth is, if we are not loving other people, we may not be loving God properly. And we probably aren't. See, loved people have to love people. There's no in between it. 
And Jesus is teaching about this in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, what we have is the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew 5 through 7, um, is one of the most famous sermons of Jesus ever, right? It's like this mega sermon Jesus gives, and we don't talk about it a whole lot because it is confusing and it's challenging. See, there's a lot of parts about what Jesus says that I can make say what I want it to say. You know, there's some parts about the Bible that I can manipulate how I need to, but the Sermon on the Mount is so counterintuitive to humanity that we either have to accept it or ignore it. And the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gives us here today is all about how we, as loved people, have to love people. At the beginning of the scripture, verse 21, Jesus is talking to this crowd and they're gathered around and this is intergenerational worship. There's children, there's grandparents, there's, there's the, the Pharisees, there's all these people gathered around Jesus on this mount and he's teaching. Jesus says something so profound. Murder is wrong. Everyone's like, you know, Jesus, that one really didn't hit as hard as the rest of them. Like, <laughs> we kind of knew that already, the idea that murder is wrong. Yeah, thank you. I mean, even the people who are not Hebrews know that murder is, is wrong, right? It's not just the law, the law of Moses, it's the law of Rome. If you murder someone, you will be put to death. That's the judgment, right? No one was surprised by this statement. Jesus was just essentially saying something like, Coke is better than Pepsi, something we all know, right? Just inherent. But what he says next does something extremely provocative. You see, if I were to, to shoot Tony, I'm not going to do that to Tony because I love you, but if I were to shoot Tony, there would be evidence that I shot Tony. You would take it to court. Everybody would be like, yeah, he shot Tony. And then I would be charged for murder. But Jesus takes something that's not that clear cut and equates it to murder. Jesus says, if you are angry with a brother and sister, you'll be subject to the same judgment. If you call someone raka, which is uh, someone who's idiot, someone whose mind is empty, you're the same judgment. And here's the scary part. If you call someone a fool, not only do you have the same judgment as someone who has murdered someone, you are subject to the fire of hell. So Jesus has taken this very real thing that we all know, right? That murder is bad, and if you murder someone, this is what happens. Something that we can all see. Evidence is clear before us. And he equates it to someone, something that only God can see. Our thoughts, our feelings, what's inside. The area that only God can judge, and he says God's going to judge you for that too. That God's going to hold you accountable for your thoughts and your actions. Not just your actions. That somehow these two are equally connected. So if you call someone a fool, if you were angry with them, if you say you're an idiot, you might as well have just killed them. And actually, it's probably going to be worse for you if that's how you live your life. Because anger, because that type of contempt for one another cannot coincide with the love of God. It does not work. Because love people are supposed to love people. And the crazy part is, Jesus takes this whole aspect super seriously, more so than the physical actions we do. If we look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, it says this, Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Now listen, this is really important. This does not change God's love towards you. This is just saying you don't love him back. Because God loves doesn't change. God always going to love you. It's never going to stop. You can't outrun it. There's no place you can get to that God doesn't reign, and God's reign includes love for you. However, if you're not actively loving others, then you cannot be actively loving God and actively following God. It just doesn't work. It's not compatible. So let's say that's where you are right now. Let's say that you want to follow Christ, but you have anger towards a brother or sister. Anger that has driven you mad. And there's a lot of things we can be angry about. Jesus tells us in the scripture exactly what we're supposed to do. It says in verse 23, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, 
And there, remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Now, for us, this is kind of a simple concept because when we think of coming to the altar, we think of coming to church, right, or coming to prayer, that kind of thing. But for the audience Jesus was talking to, this would have been a very annoying thing for Jesus to say. You see, more likely than not, if you're coming to the to the uh, temple to make an offering, you'd have just carried a lamb anywhere between one to ten miles from where you lived to church. A lot of us, if it's too cold to warm up our, our car, we're not really sure we're going to go to church, but they had to carry a lamb on their shoulder to get there. And Jesus is saying, look, I don't care how far you walked. If you get there to make your offering and realize that you're angry at someone, that someone's angry with you back home, that your brother or sister is someone that you love, that things are not right, go back. Go home. Reconcile. Here's the craziest part. Jesus cares more about the fact that you have a reconciled relationship than the fact that you're here this morning. This is worship. Jesus cares more about the idea that you and I are loving people in our relationships than he does about you being here today. Don't come. If you have to choose between being here and reconciling a relationship, Jesus has a very clear answer. Fix it. Fix it. Because you can't love and praise God like we we're supposed to if you were angry with a brother and sister. It's not compatible. You are loved by God. And loved people are supposed to love people. So if we're not willing to do the hard work in our relationships... It's showing God that, yeah, thank you for all the sacrifices you've made and the blessings and all that you've given me in my life. But I'm not willing to reconcile to make that work. I'm not willing to love you enough back, God. So it's okay. You see, we are called to be a people that are known by our love. And if anything, it's the thing we're known least by in the world. Yes, we are loved children of God. And we rejoice in the, the splendor that is our Father in heaven. But if we are not willing to love those around us and the brothers and sisters, the people we actually like and love, then God says, your worship's nothing to me. It's not just us, it's the Israelites when every prophet spoke to them in the Old Testament. Your worship is a sham. Because your heart's not in it, and your heart's not in it because you're not living as people of God. Because loved people are supposed to love people. Now, I've been talking about the idea of brothers and sisters in Christ, people you actually like, right? People who you're supposed to be doing life with. Pastor Kelly's going to come up in a second and talk about how we're supposed to love our enemies, which is even harder. But before she comes up, I want to ask you a question. If you are a loved person, by God, who's supposed to love people, then who are your enemies? Who are your enemies? And how have you loved them? Please join me as we sing our call to prayer. Before we go to God in prayer, I just want to um, let you know that we still have teacher prayer cards, um, and they'll be available after the service. So if you haven't 
picked up one or you would like some more, we still have um, cards where you can pray for teachers and uh, administrators, bus drivers, all the people that work so hard to, um, to educate our children and to keep them safe. And speaking of schools, I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, recently it was decided, the, the USDA decided that they would extend the program of feeding kids. And so until the end of December or funds run out, um, kids in the public school will be able to get uh, free breakfast, free lunch. And I can only imagine that as a parent, if, if I had lost my job because of the pandemic or I wasn't able to go to work, it would be such a, such a relief um, to know that at least two meals a day were, were being covered. And so we, we give God thanks for, um, for that provision. Let's go to God in prayer. God, you are worthy of our praise, not just for all that you have done, but for who you are. You are beyond our comprehension, beyond our understanding. You have created the world and everything in it. You are entirely good. You are love. Lord, if you didn't love us, how could we stand? Your grace is what makes life bearable. You don't give us what we deserve. You give us forgiveness, and you redeem our lives from the pit. And we bow our heads in gratitude. We confess that we have not lived into your call to forgive as we are forgiven. We have not loved others as ourselves. We have not extended grace as it has been extended to us. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for that and for all the other ways we have sinned against others and against you. Thank you for your forgiveness. God, thank you for never giving up on us. We have so many things to be thankful for, God. And we name those things in our hearts right now. God, we thank you. We thank you for. God, we thank you for our, your care for us each day. And God, we thank you for answered prayers. God, we Thank you for those who are helping. And God, we have things we want to ask you for. We're so blessed that we can just come directly to you at any time with whatever's on our heart. We can just make our requests known to you. And God, we lift up those things that are in our hearts now that we want to ask you for, knowing that you are a good father and you want to give us good things. And God, we ask for healing for those who need your touch of healing. We ask for comfort for those who grieve, whether it be the loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, God, we pray, asking you for peace of mind. We ask you for help. And God, we pray all of this in the name of Jesus who made it possible for us to come to you in prayer at all times and who is at work even now redeeming us and the world. We pray together the prayer that he taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The scripture that I am going to use is at the end of chapter 5 in Matthew, starting with verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons and daughters of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus says it's, it's pretty easy to love your friends, your family. It's pretty, pretty easy to love those who love you, those that you like, 
those who like you back. But he says, we have to be perfect, which it might make you feel better to know that perfect, that word that's translated into perfect in the original Greek, is the word for mature, to, to become perfected. Not that you can do no wrong, but that you are becoming perfected, you are becoming mature. So Jesus is saying we need to be mature, and in order to be mature, we have to love our enemies. Pastor Justin talked about reconciliation with your friends and your family when you have something that's come between you. Now Jesus is taking it a step further, saying, yes, and love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And you might be thinking, well, I don't have any enemies. I get along with everyone. I think everyone should be treated the same. I don't wish anyone harm. I don't pick fights with people. I don't have enemies. Yes, you do. Your enemies are those who you have no empathy for. You don't understand them. You don't understand why they believe what they believe or why they live the way they do, and you don't really want to understand it. You don't want to listen to their point of view. You believe it's wrong, so you don't need to understand it. You might not hate them, but you don't have empathy for them. You don't want to walk in their shoes. You don't want to feel what they feel. I'm on Facebook. Some days I wish I wasn't. Everybody talks about it, you know. Oh, Facebook is just so awful, and everybody's just being so mean to each other. And, and yet it goes on. And, and I see the posts that say, if you disagree with me, just unfriend me. If you don't like my post, unfriend me. If you don't agree with what I'm saying, don't comment. As if we're afraid to have a discussion. How about a post that says, if you disagree with me, let's get together and talk about the issue. How about we have the hard conversations with each other rather than just writing off our enemies? How about we swallow our pride and be humble like Jesus was humble? And we shut up for a while and listen to our enemies instead of arguing with them or making fun of them. We all have enemies. There is someone, maybe an entire group of people, that you are afraid of. You're, you fear that they might harm you if given the chance. They might take something from you. There, there are those that you say you care about them, but you don't necessarily want to live next door to them or go over to their house for dinner. You don't have empathy for them. You don't want to experience what they experienced. Now, we're never going to agree. We're all going to have differences of opinion it's, it's always going to be like that. Jesus didn't say, you must agree with your enemies. Now, I may never agree with you, but I will listen to you. I will, I will not unfriend you. I will not share the bread and the juice of communion with you and then refuse to talk to you or even look at you. I will love my enemies. They may irritate me. They may make me shake my head once in a while. I don't understand. But I will bless them anyway. I will pray for them, and not the prayer that goes, God, can you fix them? Clearly they're wrong. But I will pray the prayer, God, will you fix me? Will you give me eyes to see and ears to hear what you see and hear? Will you help me to love them as you love them? It's really hard. And I'd rather just stoke my anger and my righteous indignation 
But then I remember that God could have done that with me. God, who was righteous and holy and perfect, could be angry with me and unfriend me. God could give up on me, but God never does. God looks at me in all my imperfection and my mess and sees a beloved daughter. And as much as I may not like it, God sees everyone like that. God looks at everyone as a beloved son or daughter. When God looks at my enemy, God sees a beloved son or daughter. God is just as delighted with my enemy as God is with me. God's love doesn't discriminate, and neither should mine. I am loved, and I should love others. We can't grow and mature if we only spend time with and listen to the ones that we like and agree with. We can't grow and mature if we don't do the hard work of listening and praying and blessing the ones who hate us or who we think are wrong. Jesus didn't just tell his disciples to love their enemies. He showed them how to love their enemies. Jesus was hung, naked, beaten, bleeding on a cross. A humiliating, torturous way to die. And while Jesus hung there in agony, being spit on and listening to the taunts and the insults being hurled at him, he loved his enemies and he prayed for them. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus died for his enemies so that they could have redemption, so that they could be reconciled to God. Those who hated him, who reviled him, he died for them, and he asked God to forgive them. And I have trouble praying for my enemies. Imagine what it would be like if we all started praying for and asking God to bless those who we disagree with, those we don't like, those who don't like us? What would it be like if we asked God for eyes to see and ears to hear what God sees and hears? If we allowed God to soften our hearts towards others, for those who are different from me, for for those I'm afraid of, for those who hate me, what if I ask God to help me pray for them, to bless them, to listen to them? One of the greatest gifts you can give someone is to hear them, to listen to them, to hear them, to be heard. Truly listening to someone is an act of love. Now, if you're here today, or you're listening, or you're watching, and you're not a Christian, you don't have to do any of this. But I would challenge you to try it. Try wishing your enemy well. Try thinking good thoughts about your enemies. And see if that makes a positive change in your life. If you're a Christian, you are not off the hook. You don't have a choice. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus is telling us to grow up. That's what it means to be perfect. Grow up. Grow up and stop with the childish behavior of hating others. You know how little kids, they, they come home from the school and they're like, oh, so-and-so is my best friend ever. I just 
like her so much and and we just play together on recess and then the next day the kid comes home i hate her you know don't be like that grow up love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you because you are a child of god and how will the world know that god is love if we don't show it how will people know that God loves them even if they hate God, even if they're still a mess. How will they know that God loves them if we don't? Grow up, act like a child of God. Remember that you are loved. Loved people ought to love people. Let's pray. God, thank you for always loving us unconditionally, no matter where we are, no matter what we've done, no matter what we do, you love us, period. Help us, God, to have your eyes and your ears and your heart for others. May we give forgiveness and grace as it has been given to us. Amen. Let's join in singing together. So here's some next steps that you might want to take. You can memorize John 13, 34. You could choose to live this week as a loved child of God. Imagine if you got up every day and looked in the mirror and said, I am a loved child of God. How would that change your day? This week I will read the Sermon on the Mount that's Matthew 5 through 7. And we'll highlight, underline, write out, however you like to do that in your Bible, how Jesus tells me to love others. Wow. Who came up with that one? Did you come up with that one? Yeah, figures. So the last one is, before coming to worship next Sunday, I will seek reconciliation with my brother or sister. Wow. Wow. These are some, these are some, was that mine? Oh, these are some tough ones. But this is our call. We are not called to take it easy. We are called to love, to love our brothers and sisters and even our enemies. As we come to our time of offering, I want to remind you of the connection card and the uh, giving um, QR code in front of you. Um, make sure you check that out if you're online. 
Um, make sure that you check out our, our online giving up there and the connection card link that will be in the chat as well. Uh, make sure that you fill out those connection cards as you check our next steps and say, hey, I'm giving them myself um, in these ways this week. Let's go ahead and pray for our offering. Gracious God, we take these gifts, these tithes, these offerings, and may you multiply them for the glory of your kingdom so that your world may be changed, and that we may be a part of it, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In way of announcements tonight, first we have Friendship Connection, which is age three, potty trained to fifth grade. Uh, that'll be officially starting tonight. We had our kickoff last week, which is really awesome, um, and now kids will actually be able to get into the classrooms and be discipled as young followers of Jesus. Um, so that's from 5 to 6.30. We also have Revolution, which is from 5 to 6.30 for our middle school students, and 6.48, which is from 6.48 to 9 p.m. for our high school students. So any students that you have in your life, bring them tonight. We will find out where they go um, and sort them for you, okay? Also, uh, this Friday coming up is a night with New Room. Uh, Pastor Brian mentioned last week in his sermon uh, the New Room conference that we've, we've gone down to Nashville for for the past couple years. It has been truly an amazing experience. Um, learned a lot. I've been challenged there. Last year in particular was a really awesome time. Well, turns out with COVID, you can't have conferences anymore. Um, we just can't do any of those. So they're having a one night with new room experience. That'll be Friday from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Um, and then we'll be in Connection Corp. We're going to stream that together. If you need child care, we have that available, but you have to let the, the uh, church office know uh, so we can make sure we have ample people to watch those children. Um, at 9 o'clock, they're going to begin an, uh, an hour, um, kind of like a, you know, a Baptist hour, an hour of, um, of praise and worship after that. Uh, we're not sure how long it's going to go, but you can come for that as well. But there will not be child care provided after 9 p.m. because kids get cranky um, at 9, and we don't want anybody to have to deal with that type of thing. Um, it's going to be a great time. I really encourage you to come. I'll be there uh, along with a lot of us. Um, this is going to be a really awesome night. This Sunday, so tonight, at 5.15, Pastor Brian's beginning the Disciples Path class. That is a class that will teach you who we are. It's really what it comes down to, who we are as Methodists, um, who we are as a church here at Monticelli United Methodist Church, what it means to give of your, your gifts, your service, your, your presence, all those things um, that you kind of click on the term conditions on a website when you go there. Um, that's what you accept when you become a, a member of our church. Um, so it's good for you to know what that means. So that's going to be a class Pastor Brian's going to be having uh, starting at 5.15 uh, tonight. So please, if you want to learn more about the church, you want to join the church, that's the class for you. You can check your connection card or you can just show up. Lastly, we have an announcement from Pastor Brian's. So we have a video. It's hard to believe that we've been adapting and making changes due to COVID-19 for six months now. I appreciate the flexibility, cooperation, and support of the congregation during this time. On the first Sunday of October, we're going to be facing another major transition. October 4th will be the first time that we will not have a drive-in service since Easter. I want to share with you our, our plans beginning on that day. First of all, we are offering a new option. There will be an 8.30 service in the sanctuary, which we're calling the chapel. The chapel will be a 30-minute service. All participants will be required to, to wear a mask. And if you're not willing to wear a mask out of respect and consideration for others, I would ask that you choose to participate in one of the other service opportunities. Worshippers will be asked to use every other pew in order to allow for some social distancing. We'll have alternating gold and, and red rows marked in the sanctuary. The, the gold rows will be used during the chapel service at 830, and the red rows will be used during the classic service at 930. Between the services, touch points will, will be sanitized on the pews. At 9.30, the, the classic service will meet in the sanctuary. We're requesting attenders to wear masks during this service, and, and out of consideration, we, we hope that you will be willing to do this. We'll be using every other pew, and attenders at the classic will sit in the red pews. At 11 o'clock, the current service will, will meet in Connection Court. We're encouraging attenders to wear masks during this service if you're not able to social distance. As worshipers arrive, they will be given a chair and, and they can be seated wherever they would like in Connection Court. There will also be round tables where, where people can be seated as well. There will be nursery care and, and adventures in faith, which is what we call our children's Sunday school class, 
that won't be happening both at the 9.30 as well as the 11 o'clock services. Youth Sunday School will be meeting at, during the 9.30 service. Our online campus options as well as radio and cable TV will continue their normal schedule. I would ask for your patience and cooperation as we make our way through these changes. So that was a little hard to hear if you didn't hear. We're going to have the chapel service, which is going to be at 8.30 in the morning here in the sanctuary. We're going to alternate pews. It'll be kind of an abbreviated service with a portion of the sermon, maybe some hymns, but masks are required. That's the main thing. As we shut the drive-in down, I was out there this morning. I had to have a fleece on with my flannel, so we don't want to be out there in the snow, essentially is what it's coming down to. So with next Sunday being the last Sunday at the drive-in, we will move all services back downtown starting October 4th. Friends, it's been a great day here at the Classic with you. I hope to see you again next week at either the drive-in, our last one at 8.30, um, down here at the Classic at 9.30 or at the current at 11 o'clock. At this time, I ask you to please stand and join us as we sing our closing hymn. place remembering that you are loved and go share that love with the world go in peace amen <laughs>